and welcome to Behind the Headlines. We're asking the question today, is South Africa a haven for international crime syndicates? Human trafficking, drug trafficking, even rhino poaching. Joining us in studio today is Mr. Paul O'Sullivan, a forensic consultant. Mr. O'Sullivan, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. There's been a statement which was made during a meeting between the Hindocha and Ani Duwani's families. Um, Shrin Duwani's brother is said to have said, in South Africa, if you have money and influence, you can pay your way out of every situation. Is this how the international community think of us as a country? Well, clearly, um, Shri and Dewani thinks that way because I think, according to the evidence that's been led, while he was waiting for his luggage to come off the uh, carousel, having arrived at Cape Town Airport, he, he was putting his hand in the air and looking for a hired gun. But I don't think it's as bad as that. Now, unfortunately, perception is what we have to live with. You know, a number of years ago, when I was sitting on the tourism board, we had this problem with the unrest that was going on at the time in um, the West Africa, in, in, in particular Sierra Leone. And the CNN and the BBC were reporting on this from their Johannesburg office. And they would show clips of horrendous scenes, followed by a reporter on the line from Johannesburg. And everybody in the global community, they link all those horrendous scenes to Johannesburg. But I don't think it's that bad. Of course, there are opportunists wherever you go. And one would, of course, be aware of the fact that in the global uh, ranking of corruption, we're certainly not top of the list, but we're not bottom of the list either. We're somewhere there in the middle. Um, there are countries that fare a lot worse than us when it comes to corruption. Um, and most of those countries, by the way, are either in Asia or Africa. So we, we do have some challenges when it comes to corruption. If one looks at some of the recent cases, for example, Radovan Kretcher, that man managed to stay in this country illegally and running his own crime way for the best part of seven years. And he only managed to do that because he had generals in his pocket. That, that's, that was going to be my next question, Paul, that um, our crime, our police crime intelligence unit, how strong is it? and most of the people who work in that unit, how easy is it for them to be bought? Well, it's a problem. Um, one has to believe, if you, if you turn the clock back to the sort of mid 2000s, you know, between 2000 and 2006, crime intelligence became um, an economic, uh, economic activity for people to make money off. And I'm talking about the, the novo riche of the police force. So we had generals in the police who saw crime intelligence as a, as a feeding job. And the result was that anybody that couldn't get a job anywhere else was giving a job in crime intelligence. And you had people that were totally incompetent and with no training being appointed to crime intelligence at the rank of colonel, and, and in some cases higher. Now, um, Jackie Celebi, the erstwhile commissioner of police, who, who is now a convicted criminal, um, he spent a number of years turning crime intelligence into his tool, his own weapon, to stay ahead of what was then called the Scorpions, who were out to, to deal him a blow for his involvement in organized crime himself. Now, unfortunately, crime intelligence thereafter fell into the care of a man by the name of Richard Ngluli. And we all know what he did with crime intelligence. He turned it into a family-run business, where his ex-wife even had a job there. And he had a fleet of cars, and he rented houses to crime intelligence, uh, so-called safe houses. So he would go and buy a house at the seaside and, and have the bond paid for by crime intelligence, and at the same time get a rent from the house by renting it out to private individuals. So I'm afraid crime intelligence became a little bit lacklustre, to say the least. Would you say that international syndicates are running amok in South Africa? Looking at where we are placed as a country globally, for example, international uh, drug syndicates. We Every second day we hear of a South African being arrested either in Portugal, in Brazil, in Kenya, all over. Are people coming into our country and recruiting people in South Africa to help them 
traffic drugs. Yes, but that's not a new phenomenon. That's been going on for a long time. Many years ago, maybe 15 or 16 years ago, I was in the border police at the airport in, in Johannesburg. And drug mules then, the typical profile of a drug mule then, was a middle-aged white Afrikaner. And it's changed a little bit since then because perceptions in the world have changed. And unfortunately, they've, they've started preying on the African population as well, but there's still, they're still a few middle-aged white Afrikaners being sucked into the, the mixture. So you end up with the typical profile of a, a drug mill is somebody that's either out of work or in a very low paid position and wants to improve their life with a few quick bucks and that's how they get into that situation. But South Africa is not the only country. Um, there's a number of countries around the world where these drug mills operate from. South Africa is perceived to be easier to operate from because of the levels of corruption here. Uh, in theory, you can bribe anybody at the airport and take anything onto a plane. In like? Fact, well, for example, drugs. You know, it's a known fact and it's still to come out in court, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but it's a known fact that Radovan Kretscher had penetrated security and the police and the customs at Johannesburg Airport and he was arranging for shipments of drugs to Australia. Now, if you can smuggle drugs onto a plane, you can smuggle anything else onto a plane. And that's unfortunately what's been going on. So does this mean that our crime intelligence, both in the police and in the state security departments, have been compromised? Uh, absolutely they've been compromised, you know. When you end up with a situation with crime intelligence officers assisting a criminal, like, for example, Radovan Kretscher, with information to enable him to murder people, then I think compromise is probably a, a compliment. It's in fact been undermined. People like Radovan Kretscher have been able to penetrate the organs of state and they've, they're continuously hacking away. It's almost like an electric fence around a game park. Um, and what Radovan Kretscher has been doing, he's been continuously testing the fence. And wherever he's found the fence switched off, He's entered, and we've seen a situation where, for example, he took a million rand in cash and handed over to a well-known ANC uh, member of the provincial legislature. Now, when you've got individuals that are prepared to receive bags of cash, dirty money, and that's drug money, by the way, you end up with a situation where it becomes common cause for everybody to receive that money. Now. He should never have even been considered for asylum in this country because he should have been turned away at the airport. He should have been put back on the plane he arrived in this country on. But he was able to pay bribes. But you know, what, when we're speaking about names like Radovan Kretscher, we, we, we think of people who, were, who operate in a very dark world, the underworld. You're speaking of names like Lolly Jackson, Cyril Baker, Sam Issa, and other people. This, in, in this world, what actually happens? An ordinary South African who's watching us now, how would they know that they are being lured into a world where they might not necessarily been able to get out? Well, I think, you know, one has to consider one's own conscience, which obviously psychopaths don't do, and most criminals are psychopaths, so they wouldn't consider their own conscience. But if something looks too good to be true, you shouldn't be getting involved in it. Now, a lot of the victims of Radovan Kretscher were fleeced out of millions of rand, and the problem is they can't talk about it, and they can't go and open a docket against him, because they were greedy. They thought by giving him money for a drug transaction, for example, they would double their money in 30 days. And when they gave him the money, that was the last they saw of it. So they can't go to the police and say, I invested in drug trafficking with Radovan Kretscher. And you end up with this, this sort of gray area between good people and the underworld. And I'm afraid if one looks at the underworld and you draw a Venn diagram and you start putting all the figures into the diagram, you'll see that somewhere in the region of 10% of the members are serving police officers. 
but then when you're looking at, for example, uh, George Luca, who was uh, brought back to South Africa for allegedly uh, killing Lolly Jackson, uh, an, an incident like that, do you think that he's going to get a fair trial? And do you think that he's well protected by the police so he should be able to state his case in court? I will be very surprised if George Luca even goes on trial for the murder of, of Lolly Jackson. And I say this because I know that he didn't kill Lolly Jackson. That Van Kretcher killed Lolly Jackson. So um, if George Luca is placed on trial for that, I'll be very, very surprised. The evidence all points in the direction of that of Van Kretcher having shot Lolly Jackson. But earlier you were speaking about how did Rado Van Kretcher get asylum in South Africa. Are you saying that our home affairs uh, paperwork and our systems are so lacking in a way that people like that can come run away from the Czech Republic and end up in South Africa and be able to be comfortable and be able to set up a crime network? Yes, it's a very sad indictment on the country, but the sad part of it is if you arrive in South Africa and you're a criminal and you're wanted in another country and you're prepared to grease palms after you get off the plane, you can drag out your stay here for between five and 10 years. Well, the proof is Radovan Kretcher. He's now been here for seven and a half years. Now, in that seven and a half years, I think more than 10 uh, people have been murdered in this country. He's attempted to murder people in other countries by sending killers from South Africa to those countries. But let's analyze what happened there. Radovan Kretcher got off the plane at Joburg Airport with his wife and son. And they had fake passports. The passports were fake Seychellian passports with fake names on it. It wasn't their names on the passports. They were detained at the airport because information had been received from Interpol that they would be arriving on these fake passports. And the information from Interpol gave the red notice reference number and said, these people are wanted in the Czech Republic. So when uh, he gets off the plane and all this happens, he says, no, 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 I didn't do anything wrong in the Czech Republic. I'm asking for political asylum. I'm a political refugee from the Czech Republic. And if you send me back there, they'll kill me. The whole thing was a pack of lies. But anyway, the Czech government were obliged to go through an extradition process. And they went through that process. And unfortunately, because Radovan Kretcher paid bribes, and I'm talking about bribes being paid to a judge, and we now know who that judge is, and we've got evidence of the bribes that were paid. I think we, 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 after the break, we're going to talk more about bribes and judges and justice system in South Africa. On that red note, let's go for a break. back to Behind the Headlines. Our guest today is still Paul O'Sullivan, where we're talking about uh, South Africa and our status in the world as far as international crime is concerned. You're still talking about judges. And um, the judge in the Oscar Pistorius murder trial seemed to have attracted a lot of negative, uh, a lot of uh, negative comments after uh, the, after she had concluded the case. What do you think, if you had been a member of the police service during the, the, in, the initial investigations, what do you think the state should have done to prove that Pistorius had intended to kill River Sienkamp? Mm, it's a, it's a, that's a very big question. Um, I, I think the first point I'd like to make is it's very easy with hindsight after doing an investigation to realize that you could have done things differently. Now, no crime scene investigation is the same. They're all different. Yes. Now, I've been doing crime scene investigations for the best part of 40 years. So I've done quite a few of them. And I can honestly say that I've never done one crime scene 100% correctly. Because it's only when you stand back afterwards and you analyze what you've done that you realize, hmm, I could have done that a little bit differently, or I could have done that better, or I should have done that. I should have waited till I had more evidence bags instead of being uh, uh, in a hurry to finish the, the scene. Unfortunately, 
our police services, our detective services are overloaded with work. So what should possibly be a, a, a two-day crime scene often has to be truncated into two or three hours. So there were a number of issues there. And if, we, if one look at the Oscar Pistorius matter as, a, as a, an example of crime in the underworld, one would clearly take that and, and not place that as something that's going on that is indicative in an underworld. Um, the Oscar Pistorius matter, in my opinion, was either a crime of passion or in the heat of the moment or something of that nature. I don't have sufficient facts uh, about it. But if one looks at the underworld, we have a number of flaws in our system. And the flaws in general tend to be the resources that are available to the investigators that are investigating organized crime. Then you've got the corruption. Some of those investigators are themselves only keen to do a proper investigation so that they can squeeze money out of the, the person that they should be arresting. So it's a money-making racket and, and the criminals never get arrested. We've got some syndicates in Johannesburg that have been running around the city for over a decade and they've, they've, never, they've never felt the heat like they should do. So I think there are some shortcomings. However, I would say at least between 50 and 75% of the police officers out there are rock solid, good quality uh, police officers, men and women, who want to make a difference. And those are the people that both myself and my staff that work in my firm, that we collaborate with. We work well with them because we can see they want to make a difference. So we support those police officers. But the, the other weaknesses in the criminal justice system uh, I mean, if you, if you take the, 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 the chain from start to finish, you first got the crime, you've got the crime scene investigation, then you've got the detectives that have to investigate the crime and put the whole docket together. Then it has to go to a prosecutor to evaluate the docket to see if there's going to be sufficient evidence for a prosecution. And then if there is going to be sufficient evidence for a prosecution, whether the prosecutor is competent enough to be able to present that case in a court of law and whether the judge has understood what's been said in order to and whether 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 the defense counsel and this is another problem these bigwig uh, criminals people like Radovan Kretscher spend millions a year they take the proceeds of crime and they will channel between 10 or 20 percent of it towards lawyers and those lawyers will be earning three or four times the salary of the prosecutors that work for the state who are in a way more like post office workers. They paid a low salary, they get up in the morning and they work all day and they finish. They don't get any extra for working overtime. And they're up against lawyers who are earning two, three thousand rand an hour and they prepared to work until midnight or two o'clock in the morning to keep their, their criminal client out of prison and they're being paid with cash, the proceeds of crime, you know, the, the, the odds are in favour of, of the, the underworld criminal staying out of jail. But also, uh, what, uh, what, what is really very interesting is that um, the National Police Commissioner was saying that um, the media and the public should stop pressurising them when they are doing investigations because sometimes they make mistakes because of the public pressure. I don't know if that's really a psychological factor for the police. For example, the guy who was arrested for for the Senzo Meiwa murder, he was released. The guy who was arrested for the Tegrin Morris, the, that child in Reichel Park, was also released. Would you say that public pressure does have a psychological impact on police and they make mistakes? And I think that's not just a South African problem, by the way. Um, you know, I, I used to work for the, the Secret Service in the United Kingdom many, many years ago. And I remember in 1976, uh, some terrorists placed a bomb in a pub near an army town in Guildford. They called them the Guildford Four. Four Irishmen were rounded up within a week of that bombing and locked up and they spent 20 years in prison before they were released when it was discovered that the evidence against them was a, a put-together job and they, sp they spent 20 years in prison. So these, these events can happen. Unfortunately what happens, some police officers are rather in a hurry to please their bosses or to please the public. 
But that doesn't mean there shouldn't be public pressure. I think if, if there's no public pressure, the police on any organization, any organ of state, if, for example, there was no public pressure about the delays in getting an ID book, the Home Affairs wouldn't have improved their systems to get the ID books out quicker. Um, if there's no public pressure when a, a serious high-profile murder takes place, if there's no public pressure to have that person brought to justice, then, um, you know, maybe things don't happen the way they should happen. I don't think it's a valid excuse to say we made a mistake because we were being watched. You, if you're a professional police officer, you should do your job whether you're being watched or not. What you shouldn't, though, be expected to do is divulge the details of your investigation to the media That's exactly until you're ready. Mm, which is why I was going to ask you the next question. As a forensic uh, investigator, you've been around, you've worked with a lot of people. What are some of the equipment that police services, it doesn't matter which country, that they need, that you as private investigators would have that they don't have. Maybe they are expensive, but what are some of the things that you guys use that the police don't have? Oh, some no, of I the think, methods? I think the, in terms of equipment, I think the police are properly resourced. I think the, the resource problem the police have is a human resource problem. So the, uh, when I say equipment, I mean, there would be shortage of cars in some areas where the detectives can't go out to a crime scene because there's no state vehicle available for them. That's basic stuff. Um, but if one looks at the Forensic Services Division of the police today, they in infinitely better equipped than they were 10 years ago. So they have all the right equipment and they have access to the right labs now. So there's no reason why they can't do a proper crime scene. And in fact, we're now seeing them do the crime scenes in what I would call international standards. So I don't have a problem with that. I think their, their, their resource problem is a human resource problem. The guys are overworked and underpaid. I mean, I've been working with some cops recently, very good, high quality individuals who are probably earning 15,000 rand a month. Now, for somebody that's been a policeman for 20 years and has, has, has got a degree in forensics, to be earning 15,000 rand a month. And he's being pitted up against, for example, the Oscar Pistorius case. They brought in probably a million rands worth of forensic services, the defense did. They outmatched the, the state probably 10 to one. The cost of the state's expenditure on that crime scene was probably 100,000 rand. They probably spent a million rand. So they, that kind of imbalance exists, in my opinion, with the budget available to the police today, I would get rid of all the rubbish because I'm in a, of the opinion that 20 to 25% of the police officers out there, they're either bone idle and not prepared to do a day's work, or they're incompetent, or they're engaged in criminal activity themselves. And what I would be inclined to do if I was in charge of the police is get rid of that 25%, even if it means I have to write them a check to leave. Get rid of them, and thereafter spend that salary to enhance the salaries of the 75% of the men and women that are prepared to work hard and get the job done. 10 years from now, do you think as South Africa we will have been able to minimize the international crime syndicates that are currently operating in our country? Well, I believe there are actions going on. If I, if I you know, I've got an Irish passport, I can pack my bags and leave here tomorrow. I, I, I had a few years ago a green card. I let it go because of the, 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 the bureaucracy involved in keeping that green card. I wouldn't choose to live anywhere else in the world. I love South Africa and I love Johannesburg. And if I thought that it was doom and gloom, I would have packed my bags and gone a long time ago. I think all we need to do is the people of this country, the good people of this country, need to work together with the police, provide the necessary information and support the police. When there's corrupt police, um, and, and cops that aren't doing the job properly, it needs to be highlighted. And I think we have a fairly transparent system. We have the Independent Police Investigative Directorate, which is run by Robert McBride. And in my opinion, they are starting to turn the corner and they're starting to do a good job. So we have these levels of transparency. The checks and balances are in place. What we need to do as South Africans is we just need to be a little bit more positive about the future. And when we see criminals living down the road. I mean, we got somebody that came to us 
I think six weeks ago with photo, they came to us because they didn't know who to go to in the police. We get this information, we pass it on immediately. It's not for us to deal with. Paul, we thank you very much. We actually run out of time, but thank you very much. I think we'll need another hour to be able to continue talking about what we have been learning today. And as he says, if it's too good to be true, it means you must be suspicious. There's a lot of good things going on in South Africa. And let's go all out and try to do good to make our country work. From behind the headlines, I'll see you again. Cheers.